Production funding for Arts Upload has been provided in part by Francis Family Foundation, Hall Family Foundation, the H&R Block Foundation, Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John W. and F.E.E. Spees Memorial Trust, Muriel McBrien Kaufman Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Randy Mason. And I'm Maris Aylward. Welcome to Arts Upload. This week we're uploading stories about art and artists from here at the American Jazz Museum. Including a piano prodigy named Bezod and a poet called M. Beyond. Plus a support group with a lot easier name, <laughs> Hello Art. And a true American master, August Wilson. It's all ahead on the Upload. We are, of course, in a place where jazz is king. It's a musical form that's all about improvisation. Ah, but I've heard that Beethoven and Mozart often improv their way through compositions before they wrote them down. Well, the classical domain is where we turn for our first story about a pianist named Bezad Abduraimov. He comes from Uzbekistan, but has parked at Park University. Yeah, except, of course, when he's crisscrossing the globe to dazzle audiences with his skills. Producer Ashley Holcroft has more on this world-class talent who has yet to turn 25. Welcome to the office of Bezad Abderamov. On this day in May of 2015, it's in the century-old Folly Theater where he's practicing for his Kansas City solo debut. Weeks before, he was filling concert halls in Finland and Spain. And in less than a week, his workplace moves to Paris, then on to Copenhagen. His meteoric rise started after he won the London International Piano Competition in 2011. Bezod's musical journey has been guided by a series of teachers. I was almost six years old when my mother um, started teaching me all the basics, rhythms, notes, etc. And then um, I think uh, when I turned six, she took me into my first piano teacher. That was the late, legendary Tamara Popovich, who's credited with helping propel dozens of young pianists to the international stage. Next came Stanislav Udanich, a fellow native of Uzbekistan, who won the prestigious Van Cliburn Piano Competition in 2001, where he caught the music world's attention, including critic Paul Horsley. You could hear immediately that there was a very personal, very immediate style. It was almost rhetorical for me. It was almost as if he were speaking. He had studied with a broad range of teachers who had brought together the Russian school, the Germanic-Austrian tradition, the Italian tradition, uh, American Juilliard tradition. So when Stanislav decided to eschew the concert circuit for the rewards of teaching, he opted to remain in Kansas City and sell the idea of building a world-class boutique music program to Park University. The International Center for Music, or ICM, was developed to offer elite instruction to promising young players. While giving a master class in Italy, Stanislav discovered Bezod. I saw him the first time, he was 15. He has everything. He's a very special talent. It was uh, obvious from the beginning. Two, now three. One of the the most important values of him as a, as a musician is very, very high-tuned sensitivity to the sound. He is also humble in what he does, in a good sense, I mean, how he treats the musical text. I came to Kansas City being very young, only 16 years old. I didn't speak English. I was in discovery of an unknown future at that time. It can be kind of terrifying, but most importantly, I was surrounded by great people. They became 
part of my family. Now Bezad is the first artist in residence at Park University, where he sets the bar and coaches ICM students on the rigors of professional life. Everything from nuancing a record deal to the necessity of practicing four to six hours a day, to the subtleties of interpreting a musical composition. Very tricky moment when it shouldn't be too much yourself than the composer's intentions. How do you deal with nerves on stage? Well, first of all, you, uh, of course, practice for many, many hours. How much time do you uh, spend on an airplane? I've counted once uh, a year, it's most likely a month. A month? Yeah, a year. On, on, on road or in an airplane or train. But even after a critically acclaimed debut at Carnegie Hall and playing with symphonies and philharmonics across the globe, there's still one audience that causes him some trepidation. You know, they say the most difficult place to play is home. And since Kansas City is my hometown now, it's a lot of pressure because at home, you know, you know everybody and everyone knows you. And you have to go on stage and perform. And uh, it's a, a lot of pressure in a good way, of course. Hours before his Casey solo debut, Bezad is poring over the evening's repertoire, carefully plotting the delicate passages, and masterfully harnessing the framework's torrid thunders. Bexod practices in a very unique way. He will often do snippets of different pieces sort of in random order, and he will play a certain passage that he's concerned about. He'll come back to it, and then he'll go on to something else, and then he'll come back to that passage. is a strong personality as well. He's very strong. He deals with the pressure, with huge pressure, beautifully. He has this sound and this charisma and it's hard to put a pinpoint. It's, it's not just sound. It's not just hugeness of crass volume. It's, it's really about a sort of an inner fire. For me, the most intimate moment, when you play really quiet or soft or intimate places, then there, there is not even a single sound or any cough or anything, and people are just uh, so focused. You have them on hook, and, and it's, it's fantastic. My humble desire is to bring all the great music of great composers to the audience and uh, hopefully touch their souls. Arts Upload has a thing for poetry. Seeing a poet read their own work can be a pretty cool experience. And Kansas City has a number of venues where this happens on a regular basis, including the Blue Room here at the Jazz Museum. With Father's Day in mind, M. Beyond Payne and producer videographer Justin Bond teamed up on a poem she calls Daddy. When I was a little girl, I learned how to ride my bike without a helmet or knee pads. No training wheels, just your hands. And you saying, keep your balance. I ain't gonna let you fall. I placed my feet on the pedals. I was wobbly and wholly unsure of myself. But you, daddy, knower of all said, 
keep your balance. I ain't gonna let you. And soon, your voice was away from me. Soon, I was cascading down the street, breeze free. In one afternoon, I had become a rider. And all that I knew, I had learned from you. Daddy, a boy hurt my feelings today. So I called you. Heart sore, ego bruised. He left me wobbly and wholly unsure of myself. He left the shelves of my spirit so broken that I could only rely on you for help. If only dating were as simple as you made learning how to ride a bike. I kept the basics. No training wheels, helmets, or knee pads. Dad, no part of me is scared of scars. Perhaps that's why I easily fall for men who love like potholes. Those who'd like to bump me from my banana seats to theirs without any cares if I'm scraped up in the morning. Daddy, I wish you would have warned me that being breeze free won't always take me where I need to be. And I am moving too soon if I feel like I know him after only one afternoon. But dad, even if you did, your daughter is a rider. A daring darling with your tenacity in my mom's rebelliousness, double helix in my DNA, and with distance and daily distractions, sometimes your voice, it fades away. Anytime I'm in a bind, I can call you. Never asking for a thing, just expressing my needs. And real man that you are, you do what you can do. When there are cracks in my heart, you fill them with politics, car talk, and sports. Daddy, I would never accuse you of being the mushy sort. When I don't fit in the hands of men, you remind me that I'll always have a place in yours. Dad, if I'm only ever considered a lady in the eyes of one person, I hope that they are always yours. And when I need advice, as a first or a last resort, I remember to keep my balance. You ain't gonna let me fall. Once upon a time, there was an organization called the Arts Incubator. It's gone now, but one of the programs that was developed there is still around. It's called Hello Art. Its mission is to connect the people who make art, the performing as well as the visual kind, with people who might want to consume it. Sounds simple enough, mm -hmm. but there's still a lot of work for their one paid staff member <laughs> and a whole lot of volunteers. Our story about Hello Art starts on a recent first Friday, complete with a view from the 22nd floor. Anything's possible on First Friday. You know, that's what's so fun about being here is you have a bunch of people who don't necessarily get to be creative by day, getting out and exploring the arts. Some people will say that exploring the arts can be intimidating. We like to take the intimidation out of it. A lot of people have never tried First Friday before. A lot of our guests have never been to the crossroads before. So that's one of the great things about uh, the way Hello Art is structured. We partner with a corporate sponsor and then they bring 50 to 100 guests of theirs on a first Friday who get to maybe experience it for the first time ever. Welcome aboard. Welcome. Down at ground level, hopping aboard the Hello Art trolley brings several distinctive advantages. Easy parking in the Lathrop and Gage garage is one. Getting the inside scoop from a savvy pair of slicker sporting tour guides is another. The show that we are trying to get you all to go to tonight is called Pom Pom. It's at Front Space, which is... Our trolley docents are phenomenal. They do the legwork, they find out about the show, they allow people to know before they arrive at a destination what they are about to see. And then when they get back onto the trolley, then have someone to talk to. Hello Art is all about facilitating dialogue between people who might not necessarily feel comfortable having critical art discussion. Someone just actually reminded me of the last time I did this, there was a show that we went to that nobody liked the work, and we all talked about that, and everyone was relieved when we were like, we didn't really like it either. 
we try to offer some information that will make people feel a little more comfortable going up to the artist, and then the artist feels that these people already have a bit of an idea what's going on with their artwork. Hi. How's it going? We've been referred to as a matchmaker, uh, as a concierge. Good to see you. Um, yeah, we, we it's you. easier to do something that you know is already vetted for you. Uh, when your time is precious and valuable, you want to make sure that you're showing up in the right place on a first Friday or that you're going to land in a place that is worth your time. Like the old Rosedale Fire Station on Southwest Boulevard site of a recent Hello Art studio tour with sculptor and painter Tom Corbin. A lot of people still think I'm doing the highly representational work that I started out doing, like the Firefighters Memorial and the pieces of Coffin Gardens and things like that. I don't do as many representational pieces like I used to, and maybe that disappoints some people, but I, I like a new challenge. I'm heavily influenced by the Giacometti brothers and uh, African art, and I think it does have a pretty positive vibe in most cases. People don't feel like they have the access. They don't feel like they have the invitation. How often do we just call up an artist and say, hey, I'd like to do a studio visit with you? Well, a lot of artists would love it if somebody did that, uh, but instead we do that and we do it for a group and it makes it worth the artist's time. Hearing their take on what they think uh, inspired me to do something, where it can be totally different, but I, I like what they thought. I said, well, that's pretty cool. The thing about Hello Art that I love is that it's organic. It's not staged, it's not directed. So I just step back and I document it and I watch people in that moment of discovery and that's, that's the joy of it. To truly be a great art city, it's, it can't all be on the artists. It also has to be on the audience and we have a role in helping them be successful. Of course, wine plays a pretty good role in helping break down barriers, too. And just like about everything involved with Hello Art events, it's been donated. In fact, the Hotel Phillips not only donates office space to the group, but also a part of the proceeds every time someone stays in this room. The so-called AIR suite, designed by their current artist-in-residence, Madeline Gallucci. Whether it's a hotel or hospital, lab or law firm, Jander has found that corporate KC is surprisingly enthused about embracing the arts, and at times showing off some pretty impressive collections of their own. As for those distinctive name tags that seem to be popping up around town more and more frequently. It's a conversation starter. Hello Art, we've never done any publicity, never done any advertising. It's all word of mouth, and that's one of the best ways to get people to strike up a conversation about what's going on, and our members are our best ambassadors. When it comes to our events, the one thing that I love is that you will have people from all walks of life together in the same room who in their daily lives have absolutely nothing in common. But when they're together for a Hello Art event, they find out that they actually do have more in common than they might have realized. And there's something to talk about. The art is the center. That's the thing that weaves everyone together. Check out Hello Art's website to see more of the interactive opportunities they have planned at helloart.org. Another thing to check out are the great artifacts housed here at the American Jazz Museum, including the plastic saxophone Charlie Parker played at a famous concert in Canada. Lots of local memorabilia as well. Basic, Moton, McShann, and of course pieces from those Kansas City clubs that played music all night long during the heyday of Kansas City Jazz. We mentioned the Blue Room and its poetry jams, but it's really the music they serve up 200 nights a year that makes this a living, breathing part of the museum. Something else that's lots of fun here is the John Baker Jazz Film Collection, which opened to the public just a few years ago. It is truly hard to resist seeing all those great bands, singers, and dancers preserved and displayed for our viewing pleasure. And speaking of artists on film, earlier this year, the PBS series American Masters profiled the Pulitzer Prize-winning playwright August Wilson. Here's a behind-the-scenes look at the making of that documentary. August Wilson, The Ground on Which I Stand. 
His rise to Broadway was as unlikely as it was unusual. Unapologetically devoted to his art, uncompromisingly grounded in the belief that ordinary black life was ennobled with gifts of blood, of memory, of history. He would create an epic body of work, 10 plays that would go on to win a Tony Award, two Pulitzers, launch the careers of countless actors, and earn the honor of having a Broadway theater named after him. His birth name was Frederick August Kittle, but to the world, he was known as August Wilson. It seemed, you know, you're, many years ago, I had seen two of his plays on Broadway, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom and Fences. I had seen those plays. I had not seen the other plays. I had seen, that's not true, I had seen a piano lesson also on Broadway. But the other ones I hadn't seen. You know, I knew about them, but I had not seen them. And I didn't really know much more about Wilson's life than what I had read, you know, when I was doing some research on some other projects or something about actors or playwrights. So I didn't really know a lot. So when Daryl Ford Williams approached me, I guess now it's 2012, you know, about coming on board to direct the Wilson film. Then I dug in, I dived in and started to really do some very intense research, understanding who August Wilson was, where he came from, and the whole Hill District section of his life in Pittsburgh. Everyone had their own story about August Wilson, especially as his fame grew, so did the stories, you know? So everyone would say, oh yeah, well, you know, I worked with him when he, worked, when he was a dishwasher at such and such a diner. Or, yeah, I knew him, I would see him at a legendary place called the Crawford Grill. Yeah, I'd see him in the corner scribbling and nobody knew what he was scribbling about. He'd just sit there for hours smoking and scribbling. So you'd hear these stories and I just found it fascinating. August would have accomplished something that no other playwright has done in the history of the world. Write 10 plays about a specific people, one for each decade of a century. Never been done. I always say that the, the, the most exciting thing about working on documentaries is really the research part. Mm -hmm. Is when you start to do the investigation into a person's life. When you start to meet, you know, his sister or his niece and nephew, or you spend time with his widow, Costanza, and she took us to his archive, and we spent time going through those boxes of all his material, all the stuff he had handwritten, you know, little things on napkins, on paper plates, pieces of his plays that he would write, you know, because he was, he, was, he was always creating. So to me, the most important part of the documentary process really is the research, really is the getting to know the people who knew him, Things that you may not know from a person who sits in a corner scribbling and smoking is that he was a funny guy. You know, he was a jokester. He loved to, he had a great sense of humor. Uh, he loved to talk sports. Um, he was very compassionate. You know, people who were underserved or who looked like they needed a little help, he was very generous of spirit. His, he had a special place in their house in Seattle where he would work. And he had the typewriter, or the, at this point of his career, computer. He'd have it set up, and he would circle it. He wouldn't just go straight to it. He would sort of circle it and circle it and circle it. It was part of a ritual. And then he would sit down, and he would begin the process of working. You know, he'd work a few hours, and then he would stop, and the next day he would do the same thing again. He had a process of ritual, which I find is a wonderful thing to understand about an artist, a craftsperson, is that we all have rituals that inform how we approach our craft. There are issues that one would think we have passed, that we really haven't. And it's, it's actually his gift to us to have a look back that he provided theatrically to those things that are contemporary and real in our everyday lives. You can see the entire American Masters program about August Wilson. Just head to our website, kcpt.org. Our show's up there, too, in mm -hmm. case you want to catch up on past episodes of Arts Upload. Next week, we'll show you how a cartage company, Belger, has given the arts an unexpected boost. And King Lear himself, John Rensenhaus, on the joys of doing Shakespeare in the great outdoors. Till then, I'm Maris Aylor. And I'm Randy Mason. Get out and see some art.
production funding for Arts Upload has been provided in part by Francis Family Foundation, Hall Family Foundation, the h &R Block Foundation, Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John W. and FEE Spees Memorial Trust, Muriel McBrien Kaufman Foundation, and viewers like you. Thank you.